The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Well, on today's show, we're going to learn more about native plants. We're also going to visit an amazing labyrinth garden. And of course, Chef Larson has a great recipe for us. I hope you'll stay with us. Garden Connections is coming up next. About native plants today and our special guest is Dustin Demmer and he is here from Blazing Star Gardens. He's going to tell us all about these wonderful plants. Welcome to the program Dustin. Thanks for having me Stephanie. So native plants help us understand what the difference is or how do you classify a native plant versus what a foreign plant or what do we call the other ones? Yeah. Well all plants are native somewhere um, and when I refer to native plants in Minnesota I'm talking about a lot of the native prairie and wetland plants. Since they grew up in this area uh, they're used to the conditions, so they're used to the moisture requirements, they're used to the soil requirements, and uh, they're better for the wildlife around here because um, they evolve together. Sure. And native plants are nice because uh, they don't require any extra care from us, such as extra watering or extra fertilizer, Okay. Uh, because they've um, been able to handle it without for the past adapted themselves yeah, to the conditions already is there any limit to where you can use a native plant I mean clearly they've adapted themselves to this area but I mean are you able to customize like Sun versus shade I mean are those characteristics the same as the plants you find in a nursery yeah the nice thing about native plants especially in Minnesota is we have a mix of um, eco regions such as prairie where it's full Sun mm -hmm. Savanna, where it's part sun, part Partial. shade, yep. and woodland, where it's full shade. And you also have wetlands, where uh, plants have evolved to handle wet conditions, wet conditions most of the time. Which we've had a lot of yeah. this year, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> so when you are dealing with native plants, is that something that you go to a nursery and you pick up seeds, or you've got several that are started here already? What's the best way to establish native plants in your garden, if you want to include them? If it's a small garden, such as just a small residential garden, um, I would recommend plants because plants you're able to custom place where you want each and every plant to go. Okay. And when you plant them, you know they're going to grow. Right. If it's a little bit larger of an area, um, over 1,000 square feet, seed is a much cheaper option. Okay, well, um, cost effective. But seed can be difficult to establish. Native plants can be tricky to germinate sometimes, okay. and it can take a few years for them to reach mature size. Okay, all right. Well, and just with other plants as well. So yeah. if you if you want a, a ready start, you maybe start with these instead. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of these plants individually so we can identify some of them for our viewers. But right now, we're going to take a visit with Dia Kenyon, and she has an amazing labyrinth garden. Let's take a look. We're here near Zumbro Falls, Minnesota, and we're with Dia Kenyon, who has invited us out to her place to check out a labyrinth. Dia, thank you so much for inviting us to come today. I'm so excited to have you. I'm really excited too. I have never seen one of these before. Oh. Now you are into Chinese medicine and a whole bunch of things, but you have this labyrinth and I'm interested in hearing how you decided to create one in your yard. Okay, but I've been interested in labyrinths for so long, I can't say when I first got started uh, being interested in them because um, they're an ancient pattern and they're um, very universal and symbolic of a, of a life journey. And um, I love the spiral image, though a labyrinth is not a spiral. Otherwise, if you walked it, you would get dizzy and tip over. <laughs> okay. So it's a design that's just thousands of years old, and it's used in so many, it originated in so many different cultures. We can't say it started in Greece or it started in Africa or where it started, but even in Native American, um, a labyrinth pattern has been has um, existed. Yeah. Now, how is a labyrinth different than a maze? Well, I'm so glad you asked because there's so much confusion, confusion about that. A labyrinth is a path that leads to a center, and there's only one path, whereas a maze is designed to confuse you, 
Okay. Like you've probably been to a corn maze. Yep. And probably and your you listeners. Have dead ends and you yes. Find your way yes. Out. That's right. You get lost, and it's it's scary. It can be scary. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see those movies, um, and <laughs> and they're you know somebody chasing you, and you're right. in a dead end. Um, but a labyrinth. A true labyrinth would have one single path, and you can, uh, it, it, we say it, you can trust the path. So okay. you can actually have a little calm and peace when you're walking and not worry about where's the dead end? Am I going to get lost? Mm-hmm. Um, what's, you know, where do I go next? Mm-hmm. So, so one way in, one way out, and it's yeah. meant to be relatively easy to navigate. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. And so the purpose of a labyrinth is, when, when you talk about Chinese medicine, is it meditative? Is it simply exploratory? What, what are you supposed to do in a labyrinth? Okay, well, um, it's such a personal experience. I don't really want to tell you what you're going to feel in the labyrinth. And personally, when I walk it, I have different experiences each time. Okay. So the idea is to be open to the experience. And there's a connection between Chinese medicine, of course, because that has that universal image, the yin and yang, which represents um, life, life and death, or summer and winter, and fire and water, mm-hmm. and and so there's some similarities in that. There's um, this universal image; it's like an archetype or a metaphor for life's journey. Okay, interesting. Now, this sign here is the pattern that you yes. that you've created here. This is about 60 feet across that we're going to be walking. Okay. And Paul, my husband, and I created this in 2005, and it happened to be October 31st, Halloween night. Oh, okay. And um, we've called it the Mindful Path. And then just a little bit of uh, instructions on walking it if we had company or something and mm-hmm. they wanted to experience um, the, the walking path. So. All right. Well, let's walk through it. And when we get to the center, I have a few more questions for you about how you created this very interesting part of your garden. Okay, great. Right. find you turn to the labyrinth at certain times of the day or when certain things are happening in your life do you find it kind of healing Mm -hmm. in a way? It's like a meditation. It can be like a meditation just to come out and walk and be open. Some people do um, walk with a question in mind. Was this just the meadow grass that was here before or did you specifically plant this type of... No this was this was here. Oh, these are pretty. And when you walk a labyrinth, are you supposed to be looking down? Do you look up? Is there a particular way that you should follow the path? I mean, is it head up or is it, are you, are you looking at the ground? Kind of in a well, place? there's a saying in the labyrinth community, there's no wrong way to walk a labyrinth. Okay. <laughs> I imagine if you really thought hard, you could think of a, a wrong way, but... But I do understand you're supposed to stay on the path. Yes, no, no stay on the path and, and don't obsess about am I doing it right or wrong. Really try and silent, quiet the mind, still the mind. So it's more about the whole experience. It could be this footstep, you know, what is this footstep? Or it could be the experience of, you know, the bigger experience of the being in nature. In the nature. This is so interesting because now I'm almost feeling like, I feel like I've been down this part before, (laughs) only I'm going in the other direction. (laughs) And here we are, we made it to the center. Yes, technically the halfway point of walking the labyrinth. And you have some lovely fun chairs here for people to relax after their partial journey. That's right. So do you find people, when when you see them and they experience the labyrinth, do a lot of people spend a lot of time out here in the middle? Well, we don't invite a lot of people out. Okay. (laughs) Me, myself, when I come out, I might do some Tai Chi in the middle, some Qigong, some sort of movement like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just even enjoy the the 
sounds of nature. Yeah, you which, can hear the birds yeah, and things. Yeah. yeah so. And you mentioned you have quite a few visitors to the garden of the animal variety. In terms of yes. deer that will come through and... <laughs> yeah. I have pictures of deer and turkeys walking the labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They enjoy it as well. That's right. <laughs> so your regular maintenance really of this is you just took a meadow that existed and you mowed the path in here and that's all you really need to do to maintain it? Well, we do need to maintain it by mowing, but it wasn't quite as simple as, as <laughs> I, you could tell by simple. walking. So what we did is started um, in the center here and we used ropes and um, some measuring tools. Now what's different between the images you see of labyrinths is the um, dimension of the walking paths and then what we call the walls in between. Mm -hmm. So that was a little more challenging. Um, because if you're, um, you know, on paper, the line is just a line and the path is a path, but here the lines are actually walls, right. wider, right. or the same mm -hmm. width. So, yeah, that was a little challenging, but my husband's a mathematician, oh, so he helps. helps in that <laughs> component. That's great. And uh, the mowing was very fun to do. And you have mentioned to me there are others in Minnesota that are... Uh, engaged in creating labyrinths and love labyrinths. So there's some yes. resources if someone at home wanted to try to create one of these. Yeah. Who can they turn to for help? Well, there's a Minnesota Labyrinth Network, which is a network of people who love labyrinths. And I might say a lot of people who are using labyrinths therapeutically. Um, there's labyrinths in prisons. A lot of churches have labyrinths. Okay. Um, meditation, they, there's a roll-up labyrinth on that you can, like a cloth that you unroll so you oh, can take it to okay. schools, mm -hmm. take it to prisons, mm -hmm. take it to different um, you know facilities for um, they're using it for mediation okay. and uh, meditation, grief counseling, uh -huh. all kinds of resources and then there's the Labyrinth Society which is an international um, society of labyrinth lovers who use them therapeutically and create more and more labyrinths and then um, your viewers could also go to the Labyrinth Locator Oh, okay. and find a labyrinth near them All right. or where we'll they might be out. going on a um, vacation or something. Great. Now you mentioned several several ways people use labyrinths and, and we've often heard from gardeners that they just feel so relaxed when they're out in their garden, whether it's a, a more formal labyrinth presentation or, or maybe it's just digging in the dirt. And, and really, from your work in Chinese medicine, do you find that gardens have kind of a, almost a healing property to them? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Just uh, connecting with nature and with the earth and getting your mind off of your own problems you're you know focused on weeding or planting or f hoeing or whatever <laughs> mulching there's so many opportunities just to have another it's like taking care of a pet or something you know taking care of some plants so it's something outside of yourself it's very you know there's a lot of research on garden therapies I'm sure you've checked some of that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well this is very peaceful. You have a beautiful location for it and, it and it's turned out just lovely. And as you said we're in the center but not the end. Right. So shall we finish our journey here today? After you. All right as we do that stay tuned for more Garden Connections. was an amazingly peaceful visit. I really enjoyed that labyrinth. It's just wonderful. It was really a great thing. But now we're talking about specific native plants, and you're going to tell us a little bit about these. And we're going to start with the showy ones. So here is a beautiful plant. Yeah, this is uh, your common black-eyed Susan. Okay. And this is a plant that might be familiar to many of the viewers. Um, 
it's a plant that a lot of people have in their gardens. Mm -hmm. There's many different varieties of black-eyed Susan you can get at your local nursery, but this one is a is a true native. Okay. It's collected from wild seed, so it hasn't wow. been bred or okay. selectively right. breeded. And uh, you, you find this a lot in, in roadsides. Uh, very right. colorful. It is beautiful. Profuse blooms, and it's able to handle a lot of soil conditions dry a little wet very versatile okay it great. blooms throughout the year and a plant that that is this big about how old is that this plant is a year old a year old so oh, it wow. was, okay so it's pretty fast growing too. yeah very fast growing native great and an easy one to start from seed okay good so if you want to try that another pretty one very delicate purple blooms on yeah, this one this is and it looks kind of like an onion or a leek or a is it part of that family? That's, that's it. Yep. This is an allium. This is prairie onion. Um, okay. It's not edible, <laughs> but does it, it is. Smell like an onion? Does. Yeah. yeah. A little better. Yeah, a little better. <laughs> so this, quite so strong. This has really pretty blooms, and what I like about alliums is that um, they green up earlier in the spring. Okay. And they have really nice globe-style flowers, mm -hmm. which is a lot different than a lot of your cone flowers. Mm -hmm. um, yep, a more you know, flat look. Yeah. Yep. So it adds a different shape to the garden, and it also adds just a different texture. Okay. Now this one has an interesting leaf shape. This does, does. it have a flower with it? What, what do we call this? It one? does. This is New England aster, and this is a very popular plant to breed as well. A lot of local nurseries have different cultivars of plants. Those are mm -hmm. plants that have been cultivated and bred to have certain characteristics. Right. Um, this is a native New England aster, which reaches about four feet tall. Oh, and, wow. Uh, since How long does it take to get that big? It takes about two years to reach maturity. Okay. Um, it's also a very fast-growing plant from seed, really easy to get established. Okay. It likes a little wetter conditions, but can also handle dry conditions. Okay. And the nice thing about asters, which is why I recommend an aster for every garden, is that they're usually fall blooming. Oh, so you get color late in your season. Yeah. Good idea. And this guy I like, he's hiding here in the back, but he's so cute. Yeah, this is the one of my... The leaves are fantastic on that guy. It is. It's, this is one of my favorite prairie plants. This is prairie smoke. It's a very short growing ground cover. The leaves only reach about 10 inches. Okay. And this is a nice plant because it's a spring bloomer. Um, there's not a lot of uh, spring blooming plants that people tend to use in the gardens, but this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And it sends up a really small flower that has tufts of... Um, tufts of hair growing off of it, I guess you could say, which is how it gets its name prairie smoke when okay, it blooms. Okay, so just very feathery. Yeah, and when you have a mass planting of it, it looks like smoke like tendrils smoke. coming off of okay. the ground. Cool, cool. Now, native plantings often have a reputation for being very grassy, and you have some lovely grasses here. Tell us a little bit about some of these that you've brought along. Yeah. Um, prairie gardens tend to have a lot of grass because it's, it's the natural uh, ecosystems that you find in mm -hmm. the wild. Yep. Um, in the prairie, there's usually a grass ground cover, and then the flowers, which have deep tap roots usually, are able to grow within the grasses, and they provide color and, and that, wildlife that color, yep. attract yep. butterflies and bees. Well, we're going to continue talking more about native plants with Dustin Demmer, but next we're going to check out the recipe that Chef Stephen Larson has for us today. Hi, I'm Chef Steven Larson. Welcome to my kitchen at Quarter Quarter Restaurant in Harmony, Minnesota. Next recipe we're going to do uh, deals with berries. So here I have a selection of fresh berries. We've got blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries. And with that, we're going to make an almond berry coffee cake. So we need to toss these in a little bit of flour, just about a tablespoon which will help them stay suspended in the cake. So we give those a quick toss. And we'll set those aside for a minute. Then we need to make the cake batter itself. And for that, I'm using almond paste, which is ground almonds and sugar. We'll put that right in the food processor. Some additional sugar. And we need to run that so that it breaks up the almond paste.
So you want to let this run until the almonds are very finely ground. And that should do it. And we take our melted butter. Blend that until it's smooth. And we'll add our four large eggs. And blend that until it's smooth. Now a cake wouldn't be a cake without some flour, so we're going to add two cups of unbleached flour, all purpose, a pinch of salt, and a couple of teaspoons of baking powder. And we're going to let this run just until it comes together, so we don't want to over mix it. Then in a separate bowl, we're going to take the batter out of there. You can see it's quite a stiff batter. And to get the last bit out, we just pop that back on. Give it a quick spin. That cleans the blade off. And we can get rid of the rest of that cake out of there. So now we're ready to put in the berries. We'll give those another quick toss. And we'll fold those into the batter. Now it's okay if the raspberries and blackberries break up a little bit, that's fine. You just don't want to stir it together so it's one homogenous mix. You still want to be able to see those berries when the cake is done. All right, so there's that. Now, we need a springform pan. That's a removable bottom pan. I've already buttered and floured this so that the cake won't stick. I'm going to set it on another pan just in case this decides to leak and we don't want cake all over the oven. So into the pan it goes. And we'll smooth that out a bit. And we will put that into a 350 oven for about an hour. So after the cake is cooled for about 10 minutes, you want to pop it out of the springform pan and put it onto a beautiful platter because there's nothing that sets a table nicer than having very beautiful dinnerware to go along with your beautiful food. So we've let that cool completely to room temperature and I've made a simple confectioner's glaze here which is just a mixture of powdered sugar and milk so that you get the right consistency so it will drizzle well. So we'll take that and just let that fall all over let your inner artist out. All right. And then what I like to serve these is to cut a wedge out of the side. And bring it up so that you can see the berries on the inside. So there we have it. Almond and berry cake because there's nothing better than eating fresh in the garden. Well, as 
always, a delicious looking and tasting recipe. We're fortunate that we get to taste those samples when we do those filmings, and Chef Larson does a great job. I hope you will try that at home as well. We have recipes available on our website and on Facebook of all of the chef's great ideas. Well, Dustin, we're talking native plants, and these are beautiful, and I love, especially the pop of color. We've been trying to establish a wildflower population at the end of our driveway in a grassy area and had limited success. Well, I always recommend to start with a, a clean seed bed. So what I mean by that is to start with a bare patch of dirt. Okay. Um, it's really important for seed germination to have good seed to soil contact. Mm -hmm. And when seeds are interseeded into an existing grass cover, it's really hard to establish good seed to ground contact. Okay. And it can also be difficult, even if the seeds germinate, to compete with the existing plants that What's are growing already there. there. Sounds good. We'll try your advice and see if we can get that flower patch established at the end of the drive. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge about these beautiful, I love all the different shapes of the leaves and the colors that you get. It's really beautiful. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on Garden Connections. I hope to see you again next time. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook.